Welcome. On this video, we will be discussing geometric proofs and we're going to put some emphasis on angles and line segments. So before we dive in deeper into some other examples, we need to describe three different properties that we're going to be using in a lot of the proofs here in geometry. And those proofs, I'm sorry, those properties are the reflexive, symmetric, and the transitive property. Now, for the way that I'm going to be describing them, I'm going to be using the property of congruency. But these three properties of reflexive, symmetric, and transitive can also be used for any other properties that we're going to be looking at throughout the school year. So, with that said, let's describe what these properties mean. A reflexive property, it's a property that pretty much says that anything is congruent to itself. So, any object is congruent. to itself. So I guess a very basic example is if I'm giving you an angle, well, obviously that angle is, is equal to itself or is congruent to itself. Here we're using the reflexive property. Angle one is congruent to itself. We'd refer to that as a reflexive property. Another example is angle two can be congruent to itself. That's another reflexive property. And I think we get the point. Anything is congruent to itself. It can be angles. It can be line segments. AB is congruent to itself, AB, and so forth. Now, a symmetric property, we refer to this for property anytime that we want to say that the order does not matter. The order does not matter. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, let's say that we have some property where angle one is congruent to angle three. Let's say that this is something that is given to us. Angle one is congruent to angle three. Well, this is the same as if you would have said angle three is congruent to angle one. Like the order doesn't matter. Like I can say one is congruent to three, or I can say three is congruent to one we still talk about the same thing. The order doesn't really matter. And the same can be said about segments. Like, let's say that I'm saying that there's a line segment called AB, and this line segment is congruent to CD. Well, that's the same as if I were to say that CD is congruent to AB. So the order doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one you list first or second. That idea of congruency still holds true. Now, transitive property. This is a little bit more interesting. We can think about a transitive property as a bridge between properties. So let's give an example. Well, let's say that we are working with a problem where we know that angle one is congruent to angle two. And we also know that angle two is congruent to angle three. Now, if we do some kind of a mapping here, we pretty much are saying that angle one is congruent to angle two and angle two is congruent to angle three. Well, look at what we can say here. If one is congruent to angle two and angle two is congruent to angle three, then we could have just said that angle one is congruent to angle three. So you can think about this as having some kind of a bridge. Here, in this case, the bridge can be seen as angle two. Like angle two is the one that is connecting angle one and angle three. Well, after crossing the bridge, we can just say that one is congruent to three. And again, this is not just for angles. Like we could also use line segments. Like we could have said that AB is congruent to CD. And then let's say that CD is congruent to FE. Well, if we know that those three angles are congruent to each other, then we can just say that 
AB is congruent to FE. We can create this kind of a bridge. So we can have this as a conclusion. And this conclusion, we use it or we refer to it as a transitive property. So let's just recap. Reflexive property, any angle or object is congruent to itself. Done. Symmetric, the order doesn't really matter. And transitive, you can think about it as if it was some kind of a bridge. Very important that you do understand these three properties. These are just properties that we're going to use throughout the school year, and they're not just for congruency. This, I'm using congruency as an example, but we can use these properties to any other properties that we'll see that we're going to be looking at um, in future lessons. So with that said, let's take a look at some proofs that we have for today. Okay, so let's take a look at our first example here. Anytime that you're dealing with any proofs, you definitely want to understand what are you given and what is it that you want to do here, which in this case, we are given that T is the midpoint of SU, line segment SU, sorry. And what we want to show is that X actually has a value and that is five. So before we even start thinking about how are we going to approach the situation, Anytime that you are dealing with the T table or statement and reason table, the first thing that you want to do is always write down the given. So let's do that first. Always. What do we want to, how do we start our proofs? Well, let me just write down what's the given. T is the midpoint of SU. Why? This is how you always start your proofs. And then you can write down that this is information that is given to us. That's always the first step. Good. Now let's think about how should we approach this proof? Well, if T is said to be the midpoint, oops, uh, midpoint, then doesn't that cut as you in half? If T is in the middle, then SU gets cut into two equivalent parts, and that is ST and TU. So perhaps that's a statement that we can use now. If T is the midpoint, then we can say that ST is congruent to TU. Why is that true? Because T is the midpoint. Okay. Now let's hold on here for a second. ST, notice that we have the expression 7x. And TU, we have the expression 3x plus 20. Well, if they are congruent to itself, then perhaps we can put those expression equals to each other. 7x is equal to 3x plus 20. And again, you always want to write down why is it that this is true? Well, perhaps this is just a property of congruency. Property of congruency. And now let's concentrate on the left hand side. Notice that this is just a simple equation. Perhaps what we want to do now is maybe we can take away 3x. Okay. So what will be our result? So that would be 4x equals to 20. And why is that true? Well, this is just property of subtraction. Property of subtraction. And perhaps the next thing that I want to do is divide by 4. And look at what we have now. x is equals to 5. But why is it that this statement is true? Because we use the property of division. And notice that we're pretty much done here because we wanted to say, we wanted to prove that X has a value of five and notice that that's the last statement within my proof. And that's something that you should always have within your proof. Whatever your last statement on your proof is, it should be the statement that you want to prove. So it matches up. Every single step that we took here 
it makes sense. It had a reason to back it up. Therefore, we can claim that we are done proving that X has a value of Y. Let's take a look at one more example here. This example deals with angles. Okay. First of all, what do we know and where we want to go? So what's my given? I know that angle one is congruent to angle three. So again, before I move any further, let me write this down on my proof. The first thing that I always want to write down is write down the given. Okay, that's it. That's the only information that we know. We know that there are two angles, angle one and angle three, and they are congruent to each other. And we have them here on our diagram. So this is angle one and this is angle three. I know that those two angles are congruent to each other. Okay, so what exactly do we want to do here? I want to show that there's an angle called EBA. Let's identify that. E B A. I want to show that that angle E B A is congruent to C B D. And here we have C B D. I want to show that this angle that we have here is congruent to the angle that we have here. Well, how about we start by defining what those angles are? So let's take it slow. Let's start by defining what is angle EVA. Angle EVA, let's just define it again on a diagram. Perhaps I shouldn't, shouldn't erase that. Where is EVA? E. B A. But notice that angle E B A is the addition of angle two and three. So perhaps we can write that down. It is the addition of angle two and angle three. Okay. Let's define my other angle. Let's define angle C V D. So that would be C. That would be B. And that would be D. So angle CVD, notice that that's the summation of angle one and two. CVD, that's the summation of angle two and angle one. Oops, sorry, I just noticed that I didn't put down a reason for my second step. So the reason for my second step is just angle addition. And again, by angle addition, I'm just saying I can add two angles to create a new angle. That's what I refer to as angle addition. And that's the same reasoning for step number three. So angle addition. That seems to be it. Like, I think that's all we can gather from this diagram. Now, let's think about how we can use this given. I know that angle one and angle three are equal to each other. What well, notice that angle one is used on the definition of CVD and angle three is used on the definition of EBA. So how about we substitute one angle with the other? So how about when we take a look at this angle three, how about we substitute it with angle one? I mean, we know that they are congruent to each other, so perhaps it will be okay for us to just rewrite it like that. So that's going to be my strategy. Let me rewrite EVA and substitute angle three with angle one because I know they're congruent to each other. So let's do that. So my next step is angle EVA, angle two plus angle one. And again, all I did, I know that they were congruent to each other. So now instead of writing it as angle three, I'm writing it in, in terms of angle one. This is very good for us because now notice what we have done by doing this. CBD, we wrote them down as angle one and angle two. 
and EVA, we also wrote it down as angle two and angle one. So if they are both defined using the same angles, then we can say that they are congruent to each other. And if they are congruent to each other, we are done because that's what we wanted to prove here. So we're pretty much done with our proof now. Now, oops, sorry, I keep, I keep doing this. Uh, the reason for my fourth step, um, what was it? It was just substitution. Because angle one was congruent to angle three. Sorry about that. Okay, good. And my last step just to, is just to pretty much claim that they are congruent to each other. But now notice how I'm going to write down my reason. Now my reason, this is a transitive property. Let's recall what a transitive property was. A transitive property was when we created some kind of a bridge within angles, which in this case we have angles. Now, what was the bridge that we created in this example? So this is essentially what we did here. We got three different statements. We had that angle one was congruent to angle three. And then we define angle EVA as the addition of angle two plus angle three. And then we had that angle CVD, it was angle two plus angle one. So this is essentially how the transition worked in this, in this example. We got an angle, which in this case, I'm going to get EVA. And we said, look, that was angle two plus angle three. But I know that angle three is congruent to angle one. So we can rewrite that. So instead of calling it angle three, I want to call it angle one. And then we saw that angle two plus angle one was CVD. CVD. So therefore, notice that there's a big transition here. Then we could, at the end, we could just say, well, EVA is congruent to angle CVD. So notice that this is one way to visualize how the transition work here. We started with an angle, we substituted, the substitution was the bridge, if you want to think about it that way. And then at the end, we claim look, the angle that is at the beginning is equal to the angle that is all the way at the end. Hello, if you would like to continue to learn about mathematics, you can check out the videos on the left.